trying to live in peace. Please, God, restrain the hands of those who think that destruction is the way to win any form of peace or anything of value. Protect your little ones in Israel and Palestine and in Ukraine and Russia and in Congo and in every part of the world where people with power inflict great suffering on those who have little power. We pray for those whose hearts are breaking because of loss of life, loss of love, loss of health or peace. And we look to you, God of mercy. Comfort those who mourn as Jesus promised you would. For those who don't have enough to eat or heat or clothes to wear today, good shepherd of compassion and generosity, provide your flock with all they need. Feed their souls with gratitude and joy. For those who are suffering from climate change and war, from droughts and floods, extremes of heat and cold, wildfires and destruction of habitats. For those fleeing injustice, poverty, abuse, those throwing their lives to the oceans and the mercy of traffickers. We cry out to you, God, protect and save. Fill your world with compassion and generosity instead of greed that we may share from the abundance you have given and rejoice to see our sisters and brothers thriving and enriching the whole world in goodness and mercy. Jesus came to bring freedom to captives, good news to the poor, sight to the blind. And so we ask you, Open our eyes and our hearts to see your love for our fellow creatures. Bring life to the prisoners and those who feel forgotten and abandoned in jail, in slavery, in toxic relationships. God, our world is longing for your children to be revealed. Send your spirit to keep us growing towards the fullness of justice and peace that will bring the joy and freedom that your creation so longs for. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we name in the silence before you those on our hearts today who are ill or broken or anxious, people who are far from who they could be, far from where they should be, we pray that you will lead these little ones in paths of justice and peace. In the mercy of Jesus and by his name we pray. Amen. Before we come to the sermon, let's ask God to speak to us through our hymn. Now speak, O Lord. <laughs>
here in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, October is a month of harvest services. But the last Sunday in October is celebrated in Reformed churches across the world as Reformation Sunday. It wasn't something that was ever marked in the church that I grew up in, the Presbyterian church that I grew up in, in Belfast. Reformation Sunday is the day when Martin Luther, a German monk, is said to have nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg in 1517. Those 95 theses were his attempt to name things that the church was doing wrong. Abuses it was committing. Ways in which the church was falling short in its calling as God's vessel to bring good news to the world. The Reformation became a time of disputations, theological rethinking and recalibrating. And for centuries, it became a time of hatred, an excuse for wars and killings, including here in Northern Ireland. The disputes and disagreements were had and people lived and died as a consequence. Today's gospel reading from Matthew chapter 22 is also about disputations between Jesus and the Pharisees. And the outcome of those discussions also led not to better mutual understanding, but to the death of Jesus later that week. This is life and death stuff. Not just some abstract theological discussion. And the challenge for us is to resolve today that rather than being those inflicting death, we become, in the name and the power of Jesus, givers of life. Have you ever come home from a lovely evening out or an important day's work with people you wanted to impress? Maybe you're thinking about how kindly they looked at you, how witty and smart you were, how well you spoke. And then as you're going to bed, you stand in front of the mirror in the bathroom, about to brush your teeth, and you look, and there's a great big black piece of food stuck in your front teeth, or a big smudge of dirt on your forehead or your cheek, or your hair is looking particularly ridiculous. Ever done that? Well, at least you're laughing. Okay. You thought you were wonderful, but you hadn't properly looked at yourself. And now, you feel sick, stupid, and you have to rerun the whole interaction in the light of this new information. And you discover that it's not that you were such a spectacular person to be with, spectacular, scintillating company, gradually you realize that it was the grace and kindness of the people you were with that made the evening so lovely. They didn't think less of you or mock you or turn away and despise or judge you for your ridiculousness. They cho chose to see the good in you and to enjoy your company with gentleness and mercy. Has that ever happened? Anybody? Know? Has anybody? There's a few people acknowledging. Yeah, okay, so I'm, it's not just me. It's good to know. The gospel passage that's recommended for Reformation Sunday this year, which would be the last weekend in October, but you're getting it today, so you might get it again at the end of the week by somebody, end of the month by somebody else. This gospel passage is divided in most translations into two parts with a wee heading in the middle. The first part is where the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. And I've heard lots of sermons on that bit. It's the bit about what's the most important law. 
And if someone asked you that question, what's the most important law, what would you answer? Don't kill. Don't steal. Depending what your life experience is, you may pick up something different that is most central for you. Probably a law which has caused a lot of suffering for you or people close to you. But by picking one law, we'd be missing something else that was crucial, wouldn't we? I think the Pharisees wanted to say, why didn't he choose? So if Jesus said, thou shalt not kill, they could say, why did he not choose the Sabbath? He's forever breaking the Sabbath. You can imagine them saying, do you remember the man with the withered hand? And Jesus healed him right there in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. A brazen lawbreaker. They said that anyway. But their trick is to try and get Jesus to pick one favorite law so that he can be criticized for not emphasizing something else. No matter what he chose, they would criticize him for not picking something else. For not paying attention to and keeping the whole law. Jesus, though, is wise to them. He chooses the two laws that sum up the whole law so that nothing is left out, so that they can't accuse him of breaking the law. I mean, they will anyway, but they can't do it honestly. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else in the law and the prophets is fulfilled in these two. And so Jesus destroys the attack and in the same breath simplifies the, the law to utter love. Love for God that <coughs> flows out in love for neighbor. Love for neighbor that God interprets as love for God. When we show our love for God's cre creator, create creatures, God takes that as a nice thing. Just as when we show our appreciation of something that somebody has made, it's a compliment to the maker. So how can anyone argue with that? Jesus puts love for God above and before everything else, because that's what we're made for, to let our whole being serve the purpose of the one who made us, to be a source and a delight to God by being who we are, social mammals in bodies made of meat. Somehow, God has made us to be capable of reflecting the invisible God in our tiny embodied world. It's amazing, isn't it? As the psalmist puts it, let everything that has breath praise the I am. Praise the Lord, for God's love endures forever. And this praise of the I am, I am is the name that was given to Moses when he asked God, what name shall I give? What God are you? This praise of the I am is played out in right relationships with our fellow creatures, people, animals, oceans, hills, sun, moon, stars. To love God is to love God's creation. And I don't know about you, but I'm increasingly aware of how unloving I am, both to God and to God's world. So many of the ways that I live cause pollution and waste and nourish unjust relationships, abuse of people and animals, in unkind systems of production. All the stuff that's propped up by us buying into a system of consumerism. It seems impossible to find ways to live that don't involve abuse or destruction of others. Everything about our lives and our cultures seems not to be loving God and God's creatures, but rather about fearing that we won't be loved enough, that we won't be nourished enough, that we won't have enough stuff. And by the not enoughness of our minds and our hearts, 
we destroy the earth's habitats. So it's a big challenge and it's enough that Jesus encapsulates the whole law in those two. So I think that's probably why most sermons focus on that first section of the passage. But Jesus doesn't just answer his questioner's question. He makes it a teaching opportunity. By choosing to name these two laws, he's calling us to judge ourselves and to notice that the law becomes a mirror that shows us the reality of our lives. But the second part of the reading then takes it all a step further. Jesus, in his turn, asks a test question of his own. Now, I don't like to think of Jesus as somebody that was trying to catch people out. But he does push back on these Pharisees with their smart-ass questions. And he asks, what about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And the Pharisees know the answer to that one because they've been to Sunday school. The Messiah is the son of David. That's the obvious right answer from Scripture. But Jesus isn't interested in right answers. He wants to take us beyond easy answers. What matters is not what we believe about him, but how it makes us relate to each other. And so he asks, well then why does David, in the psalm that we read, Psalm 110, why does David say, the I am said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. It was understood that this God, the I am who I am, Yahweh, is written with little capitals in your Bible, Lord. Every time you see Lord, it means the I am who I am. That's the name that is translated Lord in English. In French, it's l'éternel in lots of translations. So it, it's a different dynamic. The Lord is speaking to the Messiah, whom David calls my Lord. In the Roman Empire and in much of the world, the rule has always been that the father, the pater familias, is the boss, the head, the representative of God, authority and power. And everyone underneath must do what the pater familias says on pain of death. Various expressions of this kind of patriarchy continue to exist in more or less extreme forms across the world. The idea is to hold society's structures together by these clear lines of authority, like an army. So King David, archetypal great king of Israel, was for the Pharisees the top of the hierarchy, the best king ever. All his sons are less than him. Sons obey their fathers and live under their authority. So Jesus points out that the Messiah, if he's the son of David, should be under David's authority. And yet in Psalm 110, David is calling the Messiah, my Lord. The religious leaders fall silent. They can't acknowledge that what Jesus has said gives them a new insight. That would be to recognize his authority, his gift for teaching, their own need to keep learning. That would be to recognize his authority over them as a teacher. Maybe their silence is also that silence that comes from having no smart answer ready. Or it could be a silence that comes from processing new information, from seeing the world in a new way. It takes time to absorb a new idea. And this was truly a revolutionary idea. The idea that the Messiah was not only the son of David, but also David's Lord, does one of two things. It means that the Messiah was not only a human being, but had a special relationship 
with someone even greater than King David. We know that David's Lord was Yahweh, the I Am, the God of Israel. This text strongly hints that the Messiah is not only David's son, but God's son. More than that, the Pharisees would have understood well what Jesus was saying. The Messiah was not only a son, but the Lord, Yahweh, the living God, David's Lord. This, this is a huge thing to claim. It takes time to reflect on and sit with and let such an idea reconfigure everything about how we understand our world. The deeply troubling thing about such an idea is that it reverses the flow of authority and power in the world. Instead of a power and authority flowing down the generations with every child subject to their parents, here we have a son of David whom David calls God. Who's in charge now? For anyone who has any sort of stability and comfort in the way the world is organized, this is completely unsettling. It turns on its head the whole power structure that they function within. Their society, the Roman Empire, both rely on children obeying parents, big people being senior and superior to little people. These structures are the foundations of Roman Empire, with the head of the household having absolute authority and power of life and death over every person, slave and free in his household. And it's no accident that at the head of the Roman Empire, the emperor claimed to be God. Much of the global church has inadvertently <coughs> bought into versions of this patriarchy, thinking that the context into which Paul was writing was somehow part of the way the world is. And so when we come to scriptures, we find the early Christian leaders, the apostles, the writers of the gospels, processing this transformative idea, trying to work out what it means for the world. The Messiah, who is both God's son and the son of man, turns upside down every manifestation of patriarchy, every abusive power system that keeps the powerful on top and the weak or powerless at the bottom. And once the Pharisees see this, they don't ask any more questions. They know they should acknowledge Jesus as their teacher, as their own Lord and Messiah. But ultimately, none of us Christian or non-Christian, can ignore the authority of Jesus in our lives. He doesn't come from above to impose himself. That's not how he chooses to bring his power into the world. My favorite parable is when Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like leaven that a woman took and kneaded into 60 liters pounds, can't remember, of, of flour, and until the whole batch was able to rise. So it's an inside-out transformative power, not a battening down with great armies kind of power. God comes to us in God's Messiah, not on a white charger, but with humility, and he takes the place of a criminal, abused, humiliated, stripped naked, mocked, and put to death on a cross. As Paul writes in Philippians chapter two, in your relationships with each other, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a slave, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human being. He humbled himself 
becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. My friends, you have been entrusted with the most transformative news that the world has ever known. We're used to it because we've been listening to it, many of us, from when we were children. But this is the stuff that changes the world. Mary sings her Magnificat about God bringing down the mighty and raising up the humble. It's everywhere through scripture once you start looking for it. God has another way of being that is about bringing life from the inside. Even the way God creates is not with bolts of lightning and great explosions, but the word. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In him was life and that life was the light of all of humanity. You've been entrusted with this mystery. It's worth being curious about it. It's worth living the freedom of it. We're no longer slaves to Roman patriarchy. It's no longer sufficient to say, the boss told me to do it. Now the littlest of us, the most menial worker, has moral authority, God's authority. And with it, responsibility to love God, to love each other, and to live not according to the laws of patriarchy, but in the grace and mercy and love of the one who sees us as we truly are. Yes, we are fallible with ridiculous hair and something stuck in our teeth. Yes, we are small and have big ears and big soft eyes. God sees us and knows us and delights in us. And God's merciful grace is contagious. How can you breathe this merciful grace in your world today, this week? Friends, in our theological disagreements or other disagreements, let us live fully God's law of love. Love for God, love for each other. And if those who disagree with us turn their opposition to harm us, let us joyfully embrace the opportunity to suffer with Christ. Receive the Spirit of God that will empower us to serve rather than to impose our own way. Let us be the body of Christ ready to die rather than to kill, ready to let our own self-giving love flow from the source of redemption for the world by the Spirit of Jesus Christ at work in us. Lord God, hear our prayer as we cry to you to let your kingdom come and your will be done. And let us be the body of Christ and carry on to completion the work that you have begun in us. Give us courage and mercy and wisdom. Above all, give us the spirit of Christ to glorify you and to be what you made us to be so that the new humanity you've created in Christ may be seen in us and that the creation which is groaning as in the pains of childbirth may rejoice to see the children of God alive, even if we die, because you are at work and the risen Christ is in us. To you be all praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing together, Lord, who in thy perfect wisdom times and seasons dost arrange.
so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide in us and in our community today and forever. Amen. <laughs>